Welcome everybody to Beers with Bill. It's my pleasure to welcome back Zach Gordon from uh, Cowbell Brewing. Zach, welcome back. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me. Happy to be back. I had yeah. a great time last time with uh, with everybody. I recognize some of the faces, but um, yeah, it was it was a great time. Happy to be here. Yeah. We're starting with Shindig tonight, right? Yes, we are. Yeah, absolutely. If uh, if everybody was able to get it, or some of you were able to, um, that's awesome. You can drink along with us. If not, and you got something else in your glass, then uh, that's no problem too. Um, but yeah, we'll uh, we'll crack right in. Um, so Shindig. Um, this was our very first lager that we ever created at the brewery. Uh, so initially when Cowbell first started, we were thinking we were probably just going to be producing ales only. Uh, that was kind of our, uh, our thought. And that was almost just over five years ago at this point. So we had started out with Absent Landlord. Uh, we drank with uh, that at our last call. And uh, then we came out with Bobcat, which we're going to drink next, uh, which is a red. And then we got into Boxing Bruin, which is an IPA. And, uh, and then started to build from there. But we didn't think that we were gonna have a lager. And sort of what precipitated this was the folks around Cowbell in Huron County said, hey, we love Absent Landlord. It's a great beer. Um, it being a Kolsch Lagerdale, it was approachable, it had some flavor, but it wasn't light enough for everybody. The general consensus out there was we need something, we need a like crisp, clean lager um, Absent Landlord is good, but what can you make that's lighter? So it was a bit of a challenge to us because we thought, you know, maybe we just stick in the ale category, but uh, we started diving into lager recipes and where we wanted to go um, with that to, to give essentially the customers what they wanted, um, to give our, our populace what they wanted. So um, that was sort of the idea behind Shindig was uh, have a light lager that's still fun and easy drinking, but still has a little bit of flavor set to it. Um, <clears throat> oh, it's 4.2% uh, in alcohol. Uh, it pours clear, pale gold, yellowish, if you will. Um, translucent, almost a bit transparent. Uh, you can see through it. Um, nice white pitch foam head. Um, and then at the end of the day, just very effervescent, uh, clean and easy drinking. Um, we do have a little bit of a, of a hop presence here. And this was sort of a nod to when we were creating this beer, we, we thought we'd make it a bit like a, a Pivo style Pilsner. Uh, so give a little bit of nod to, to that region and um, it makes something that still had just a slight bit of hop contingent to it. Uh, so you're gonna get some of those like cereal grains on the nose a little bit of baked bread, lightly floral. Um, the flavor is clean, it's crisp, bright, it's effervescent, which I really like, um, nice and bubbly. Uh, you get some mild hero grain in there as well too, uh, some bready malts and just that light hop backbone on the end, uh, which makes it uh, very quenching and, and nicely balanced at the end of the day. How I say this was, um, this is our only lager, um, though we have been busy at Cowbell uh, cooking up some new things for everybody and one of those things uh, was that we wanted to introduce another lager to the mix. Um, so for anybody that's been up to Cowbell recently uh, they would have tried Smooth Sailing which is a new light lager that we just put out. It's four percent so we dropped a couple of percentage points and uh, even lighter uh, and more easy drinking uh, in that same vein of uh, you know branching out in the lager category a bit more than what we've done in the past. So that's, um, that's a little bit about, uh, about Shindig. Um, this to date, which was kind of interesting, was our highest overall consumption beer at the Cowbell Brewery. Uh, so not what customers were buying outwardly at the LCBO and beer store and all of that, but uh, what people were drinking predominantly when they came to Cowbell. Um, we just saw a huge shift once we introduced that, um, it became dominant. So we're curious to see how the new lager translates in that department as well, whether that's going to be something that will overtake Shindig or if these two lagers will go hand in glove and, and they become the dominant focus or if tastes and um, patterns change, uh, time will tell. Um, so you can buy this 
at uh, at the firm at Cowbell. Obviously, uh, we have it at the LCBO in the 473 mil cans, which is what you guys would probably be most familiar with. And for anybody that shops at the beer store, uh, we do have them available in these 12 by 355 mil packs uh, that we just launched. And uh, we also launched a six by 473 mil pack as well. Uh, so a little bit of a new pack size for us at the at the beer store, but we're trialing out that to see if uh, if that's something that the that the customer set wants. And so far, so good. Um, also get it at a few different grocery stores as well. And uh, and that's sort of the uh, the take on take on Shindig. Does anybody have uh, any questions about the beer? No, they've all been trained not to ask questions. Just throw them in the chat line. Okay, right, right. I forgot about that. No, that's okay. That's okay. So you've been you've been back up to Cowbell, like back up to the brewery now. Yeah, I was actually there uh, today. I was able. Uh, I was doing a beer education for our team members. So as you guys have all known, we're we're just sort of getting into the reopening of bars, pubs, and restaurants. Uh, that includes us at Cowbell. So we've been able to do some patio and do our uh, green space area as well which has been fantastic. Uh, we just, we added a second tent to the green area. Uh, we have our draft trailer now parked there in perpetuity for the summer and into the fall. And then we also introduced a food truck as well. So uh, the idea here was that we didn't have to have our servers running, you know, the hundred yard dash out of the brewery to then service the people under the tent. It was that we could have sort of a more casual one-stop shop in the green space where you could get food truck food so uh simple but flavorful fun stuff there and then you could pick any of our beers from the draft trailer um so it was convenient and you could just be in in one spot um use the brewery for washroom or whatever but you didn't have to worry about having a server in that formal experience it was a little bit more casual and could service more people given the restrictions that we're all under right now um Helicopter trips on now. Uh, good question. I don't know. That's uh, Great Great Lakes Helicopter, I believe, is the company that runs those. Um, so we have had people helicopter to Cowbell, which is pretty cool and makes for quite a show. Um, but being out so close to Lake Huron there, you get tremendous weather, which I experienced today uh, with some, some crazy storms that blow in off the lake and, and wind, and that can definitely cancel a helicopter trip pretty quickly but yes people have flown there by helicopter um, not myself but what a what a what an entrance it makes that's for sure so how did it feel being back in the brewery oh you know it uh it felt amazing bill it was um it's i've been there twice this year and the last time i was in there we were in complete shutdown we had you know ecom sort of dominating the main area of the brewery so you walk in everything's kind of quiet and dim there's there's no life there's no joy in the in the building in the same way you know everyone's just sort of packing up beer to ship out to ecom customers uh which went through the roof over the pandemic so it, it's great that people were able to to you know sort of adopt to that conduit uh for getting their beer if they didn't feel comfortable going out to the lcbo or beer store or grocery um but they yeah, it was a big change. So this time going out, there was life there. Um, I saw people sitting under the tents, having beers, having a good time. Um, inside the building, no, you can just walk up to the bar and sort of pay or order or whatever, and then you got to get out to the patio. Um, but the patio had people on it too, which was really nice to see. Um, you know, there was a bit more liveliness back in the building, and obviously everyone's pretty excited for uh, for Friday when we kick into the weekend and, and we can bring people back into the building and, and get that vibe going again, you know, get people out for tours, uh, get them experiencing the building, see the brew house, um, meet more of the team members, just have, have the experience that that building was built for. Yeah. So it's going to be everybody on deck on uh, Friday? Yeah, I think so. So, you know, that was sort of what precipitated the training was just to get everybody. We have a lot of new hires um, in our F&B side of things that uh, we wanted to get trained up and then also some new hires in other departments. And we, we value beer education across the board, whether you're working front lines in sales or, um, or you know, bartender, server, hostess, um, you also need to know your stuff when you're in accounting or you're, you know, in marketing or any of the other departments because we all talk we all want to be able to talk organically about the beer and share the love of our beer and other people's beers and so 
uh, it helps to have some some education on that front too. So re remind me, you weren't there right from the start, but close enough to being right there from the start. Yeah, I, I joined uh, just over five years ago. So I was May 2016 when I officially started and I was one of three on our sales team at that time. Um, our team consisted of about seven to 10 other people at that time. So we were a pretty small outfit. Um, everybody sort of was wearing multiple hats and doing what they had to do. There had been a lot of planning and thought that had gone into a lot of the logistics, but there was a lot of development that still had to happen because we didn't get the brewery until uh, August of 2017. So okay. our first batches were coming out of uh, Collective Arts facility in Hamilton. And then we did a little bit of uh, contract out of Brunswick Brewery in Toronto. And then we were able to get our stuff uh, all in-house. Okay, so essentially you've been there from day one. Yeah, yeah, uh, early <laughs> early days, that's for sure. sure early early days. days. So how many, pe how many yeah. people are there, are there now at Cowbell? <sighs> You know, I, I don't know. That's a good question. And I'm not sure where we're at. Uh, at our largest point, we were almost 170. Uh, yeah. When you consider the restaurant, F&B, that whole side of things, it was, it was uh, insane. It was hard to know everybody, frankly, because I'm, I'm not there very often. I'm often out on the road in, in my own yeah. region. So going out there, there's always new faces, uh, even tough for the people that were in the building all the time, because lots of new faces, lots of development. Um, but now I, I don't know. Um, maybe, maybe we're half that or so, yeah. um, maybe a bit less. I, yeah. I think we're a bit of a leaner outfit now. Um, but that would be my just my best guess. I, I actually don't know. I don't know if we're going to facetiously answer Graham's question about is there a manual for starting up a small brewery? <laughs> no, uh, there's never been one written. <laughs> I don't think so. It's, uh, you know, put your best foot forward, do all your due diligence and uh, learn from your mistakes, I think. Uh, yeah, I'm going to open up this chat here because I see them popping up. Okay, here we go. Uh, do you want me to address that now, Bill? If you want to. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, so Jen asked, uh, I don't know if you guys are looking at the chat there, but Cowbell seemed to scale up faster than a lot of new small brewery difference that allowed that to happen. Um, so great question. Um, it was a lot of planning, a lot of research, a lot of diligence that went into what the Sparlings had in mind when they were crafting this brewery, a lot of consultation and a lot of funding. And you know, I mean, the, the brewery is no no secret for what it is. It's a it's a massive facility where a lot of money was poured into it, but it wasn't recklessly poured into it. It wasn't uh, let's throw a whole bunch of money and make this beautiful facility and then hope to hell that it works. It was uh, how do we do this? Why are we doing it? And let's make sure that we plan all those details properly so that when we put the money into it, it's going to work. It's not this looks great. And then one year later, you're going, oh, hell, who did this? Why did we okay this spend? <laughs> you know, And then you're fixing all these problems. It's a, it's a state of the art brew house. Um, you know, if anything, I think we, we could have added more space into the brewery side of things just for logistics of like getting trucks in and out and, and getting forklifts in and out and that kind of thing. So maybe there could have been a bit more um, thought there, but we didn't know how how big it was going to get either you know you go for gold and you want it to to continue to grow um, but the upshot is is that we're on a significant amount of land out there we're not we're not pigeonholed in the city where you don't have that ability to annex that next space you know we can build outwards from our brewery should we need to and fortunately actually we we were able to get uh, an adjacent building to our property which was once inhabited by the emergency services training center so that was owned by the municipality and uh, unfortunately was was bleeding out some money and they were falling into hard times they needed to move it but it's a relatively new build and uh, has big garage doors on it uh, lots of warehousing space and this is what we needed uh, so we were able to purchase that building from the municipality and, and take that over. So that's alleviated a lot of our space constraints that started to come up over the years. And now we can store much more items, bulk items that we would have otherwise had to pay for storage um, offsite. 
and you know there's the logistics of getting those to and fro so um so that's been a big help um and a future future asset of ours um so yeah i think i hope that answers your question okay yeah great yeah awesome so what's what's the second beer we're going to yeah let's uh dive in so uh next up is uh, bobcat so hopefully you guys were able to get this one this was uh oh, pardon me that's my dog <laughs> Uh, this one is a West Coast Red. So a uh, little tidbit on all of our beers, and you guys are going to see this uh, fairly soon in the marketplace, but uh, we're going to be going through a little bit of a, of a brand refresh. So we're, we're kind of thinking about after five years, what are some of the things we like about our brands? What are some of the things we don't like about them and how can we make them a little bit more relatable? Um, so I don't have any sneak peeks for you, but uh, we do have some some updated cans that will be coming out over the next few months. Um, probably in all reality, they won't land until about the fall, but um, we're just finalizing a few little details on them. And we're simplifying some of the names um, but no changes to the recipe, uh, if that's what anybody was wondering. We're keeping the beers the way they are. We're very happy with the recipes that we have, but we wanted to, uh, to do something that just keeps the brand uh, evolution happening because uh, I'm sure you guys can appreciate and all the beers that you've been drinking over the years, they, they do go through these things. Um, they do like uh, changing and, and evolving. So um, yes, I like the stories too. I like the stories too. Uh, Katie, yeah, uh, and we are keeping those. those. Those are part and parcel of their brands. They will never disappear because they are part of uh, our lineage of the brewery. Um, will they be all making it on the back of the cans going forward? I don't think so. Um, so it's just an effort to make the cans pop a little bit more and, uh, and leave room for details on the beer uh, as well as still sort of shed some light on the, on the origins of them. Okay, Bobcat. Uh, so West Coast Red. Um, this is a West Coast Red. Um, we made this sort of style category happen here because we source our hops from Yakima Valley out in Washington State. So every year we go out and do a hop selection. Uh, we pick the best lots of the hops that we use in the beers and, uh, and bring those home and, uh, and use them in our beer. We secure hop contracts for, I think it's up to five years at a time, if I remember correctly. Uh, so you can guarantee that you can get those hops because you guys might remember in the past, there's been a shortage of Citra or a shortage of Mosaic or whatever it happens to be. This allows you to guarantee that, you know, as long as your volume doesn't absolutely spike and blow out of the thresholds that you agree with, with the hop companies, um, they'll be able to provide you with the hops that you need so that your recipe doesn't change. So it's a great, uh, great opportunity that we've been able to do out in the premier hop growing region of North America and, uh, and be able to make sure that we have continuity in our beer so that we can keep, keep those coming. Um, so West Coast Red. So that's sort of the idea behind this beer is that we source those hops from West Coast and, and we wanted to make sure that people understood that it wasn't just your typical English red um, or sort of that mild. This had a little bit more of a hop characteristic going forward. It's 30 IBUs, so it's not, you know, breaking the bank on, on IBUs or hops, but we wanted to have a focused bitterness in this beer, something that was going to give you a little bit of that citrus, that pine, that resin, uh, to balance out the malt profile that we put in the beer. Um, we use um, a caramel malt, a red X, um, to give it some coloration and some body. Uh, I think there's foam in there too, if I remember. And, uh, it creates a, a beautifully balanced beer with a really nice hop, hop forward up front, and then malty backbone on the uh, on the back end of it. So, cheers. Cheers. Derek's curious: Is there some sort of a priority assignment with the hop growers out in the Yakima Valley? Because yeah, who gets the best of the best lots? Yeah. It's a it's a great question. So that the best of the best is what you determine. Um, so if you, you could, um, essentially just say, Hey, I want these hops, give me whatever you got. You will get some variety in those lots because not every lot is the same, but if you actually go out there, you can go look at those hops. You can do hop rubs, hand select, 
those lots that you want because you deem them the best characteristics for your beer. And that's where that education piece comes into play where we send, or in the past, we have sent our brewers out there because those are the guys working with those materials um, firsthand. So it doesn't really help if I go out there. I mean, I could give my two cents on it, but I'm not a brewer. Those guys know not only how do they smell and interact and what are their chemical compounds, it's how are those going to interact in our beer? How are those going to best play forward in the beer, right? It's sort of like your chef selecting their ingredients. You know, uh, I don't know what I would use there, but like, you know, carrots, for example, or something, you know, we might pick them because we think they're great, but he, you know, a chef might say, uh, no, you know what? I would select these ones instead because they're going to make the soup that much better. So uh, if that's an analogy that kind of jives with everybody, that's, that's sort of um, how it is. So I don't know if there is like, the best of the best lots or if it's just really more what you think is the best lot for you just because presumably you could have like a hundred or several hundred breweries going out there and all kind of doing a selection and you know maybe even if 10 percent of them agree like oh this is this is the perfect citra this year is there like a priority allotment because it's not going to be an endless supply so i'm just curious about that is it kind of based on the contract you've signed it guarantees you x amount of whatever citra you choose or yeah, versus no, it's, the next guy or that's a great question and i don't i don't fully know the answer to that uh i would from what i gather when you when you assign your contract you're guaranteed that hop um from there you can do selections every year or you can say you know send me your cascade that you have for this amount because this is what i need for my brews um it just depends on what your frequency is of, of going out there to actually check in on what hops you're getting. And yes, if there's all of a sudden a run on something like Citra, as long as you've signed your contract and you have Citra locked in for five years, you're always getting Citra. Um, it's just a question of what allotments you get. If everybody wanted the same ones, I don't know how they pick it. I don't know how you um, make that decision. You know, if there's a priority sequence or, or what, but good question. Good question there. Um, so yeah, so Bobcat was our, our second beer that we produced at Cowbell. Um, so it's pretty near and dear to my heart. I, I really do enjoy this. Uh, I've gone through cycles of drinking it more frequently and then fallen off it a little bit. Uh, I find even on nights like tonight where I'm sitting out here and you know, it's been a relatively hot, humid day, but now that it's cooling off and breezy, like something with a little bit more body and heft is it's actually a really refreshing, uh, even on a summer night. We tend to find that this beer sells uh, predominantly well in September to April because it is perceived as a winter beer. Um, but, uh, you know, even uh, Troy and, and Bill, you guys can attest uh, when you're curating a tap lineup, it's also nice if everyone's coming at you with lagers and IPAs. It's great when you have something in your portfolio that is a little different, right? That can offer, um, you know, a little bit of balance so you're not bogged down with all of the same styles of beer. Very true. That's very true. So tell me, in your opinion, in the last little while, what's been the, the most difficult obstacle to overcome during COVID? Um, for me or for the brewery? You, your choice. Um, well, for, for myself, it was because we, we got into a pretty, you know, we're in a routine of, of visiting our customers, both bars, pubs, and restaurants, and then uh, our different retail channels. So LCBO, beer store, grocery store. And when COVID hit, we lost bars, pubs, and restaurants. And that was a real tough one. We fell for them. Um, not a lot we could do on that side besides, you know, support with some takeout and, and that. But that was a tough, uh, a tough thing to, to actualize for us personally, because we had some good standing relationships but then also as a brewery, because you lose that channel. And so all of a sudden you're flying around, picking up kegs that you, you know, paid people to make, paid for the ingredients, paid to store them, paid to ship them. And now you got to reimburse and take it all back and in all likelihood dump. Um, so that was a, that was a real big challenge uh, for that channel. We also had a lot of issue uh, with the LCBO because they shut us out of going into stores uh, when they started doing capacity um, 
reductions to the amount of people going in the store. They were having their own staff decide that, you know, they didn't feel safe in their environments because of all the people that were still allowed to come into the LCBO. So they had, you know, people going on leave and they didn't want reps going into stores to bother their employees and or um, take up space that's otherwise reserved for the customer. That's the paying customer, right? So that was a bit of a challenge because we then had to adopt to more phone calls, emails, text where we had people's numbers and be able to sort of interact with our customer set in a whole different way. You know, much like we find ourselves on Zoom these days uh, and doing different forms of media for, for communication, we had to do the same thing more predominantly than ever with all of our, our different retail partners. So that was a bit tricky uh, and a bit of a challenge during COVID. Um, maybe to answer the other half of that, which is for the brewery, I think, you know, it was the assimilation of all the, the beer that we had to dump. I mean, that was a pretty big hit to the bottom line, but uh, was getting e -com up and running. Um, we had already done some work in that before COVID hit, thankfully. So we were hitting the ground running a little bit, um, but, you know, that took a lot to to get the beer out the door in a timely fashion and make sure packages were arriving safe and not damaged and dealing with yeah. customer support. I mean, it was a big, uh, big transition there, um, which I think ultimately went very well. And we're, we're happy that we have that channel, but uh, I think that was, that was definitely a challenge for the, for the brewery. How's COVID changed either Cowbell's message or how Cowbell gets their message out? It's a good question. I think uh, it changed how we get our message out by just adapting to all different forms of communication. Right. I mean, social media is always a big one um, because people are looking at social media probably now more than ever um, being, you know, more recluse and more at home, um, having access to Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you name it, email blasts going out to inform our customer set of what's going on. Um, so, yeah, I think that all of all of that has been uh, a bit of that challenge there. Are you using um, channels of communication that you would not have used? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think we're just using them more than we have in the past. Like typically I like to do most of my business face to face, but I've had to adapt to doing more digital, um, whether it's email, text or, or phone calls. Um, but I'm, you know, I much prefer this where at least I can see people's faces and you can have interaction as opposed to emailing back and forth where you're sort of, you know, it's the new kind of snail mail in, in some <laughs> respects. Right. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just different, but it's, um, it's not bad. I mean, we all, we all adjust and we all adapt as long as you can still get your work done and, uh, and still get some results out of it. It, uh, it all comes out in the wash. I'm curious, mm -hmm. with everything that's happened over the last 18 months, how does Zach stay grounded? Yeah, um, a lot of time with the fam. That's always a big one for me. Um, and we've had lots of it um, because the kids have been out of school. Um, you know, online school was its own set of challenges. Uh, I've got a nine-year-old and a five-year-old, so I'm not sure who has kids out there of various ages. But um, each presents its own challenges with this kind of scenario. Um, but yeah, I stay grounded with um, with making sure that I can keep them happy because when they're happy, everybody else is happy. Um, and a lot of uh, physical exercise too really helps me out. Uh, I find that's a, a very like way to reduce my blood pressure, if you will. Uh, even as simple as taking my pup out for a walk, putting in the headphones, listening to some music, listening to a podcast, just something to you know get into your own headspace and relax. Um, and all that sense during the pandemic of confinement, you know, especially the early days when it was, you know, you can't, everyone kind of felt like they couldn't really go outside and do anything. And that's not very good for anybody's mental health. So um, getting outside and getting away from the home base and, and moving around felt, uh, felt very good. And that's what helped me stay grounded. I think we should grab the next beer. Yeah, We can absolutely. talk about it. That'd be great. Um, so the next one up, uh, Hazy Days. And uh, you guys may have noticed, depending on how often you see this beer or purchase this beer, that uh, we went through a little bit of a change with this one. Um, this one's not part of our brand refresh, excuse me. Um, 
but what we did is we, when we first launched this beer, which was in April of 2020, uh, so right at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, so it was a bit of a, a tentative moment there because like I was just saying, we would go out and sell this beer into stores and bars and pubs and restaurants. And then all of a sudden, all of that was just taken away in a heartbeat. So here we are launching a brand new brand and we have to pivot on how we communicate that new brand to people and, and share it with people. So that was definitely a bit of a challenge. Um, when we first put it out, we put it out as a seasonal. So this was coming out as a spring, summer seasonal for us. Uh, we had it in wrapped cans. Uh, so you'll notice all of our cans that you guys have are all painted uh, most likely. Uh, but when we put something into a full-time SKU, we paint the cans because it is more cost-effective. And personally, I, I like the feeling better. I, I don't love the, the crunch of the, the wrap, the, the paper around it. Um, personal feeling uh, on my end, but I do love the look of a painted can. Uh, the new painted cans that came out uh, have a bit of a sheen to them. And this was something that we're probably going to flip back to more of what the matte can looks like. Uh, when we when we go back to it, it's just we've got to run through this existing batch uh, first. But nonetheless, the liquid hasn't changed. Um, and this is a, uh, an awesome beer. Obviously, there's a huge haze craze going on out there. Everybody wants hazy, um, hazy beers, hazy pale ales, hazy IPAs, you name it. Uh, tropical, juicy uh, flavors are definitely on trend right now and have been for the past little while. So uh, this was our foray into that market. Um, and I think we, we really nailed it with a good one here. Uh, it's 6%, it's 35 IBUs. So it's got some weight to it to allow that flavor to come through, uh, but it's, it's dangerous. You know, you don't, with these hazy beers, I find they mask their alcohol really well. Even double IPAs, double hazy IPAs, uh, they, they hide it very, very well. Um, so yeah, um, tropical juicy aromas, lots of, uh, tropical fruits, pineapple, mango, um, papaya, really, uh, really gorgeous nose, um, beautiful head on the beer. And again, tropical juicy, just the right amount of bitterness on the end. I, I do like when hazy IPAs still hit with the bitterness. Sometimes they get super cloudy and and almost over haze and then you're just drinking juice and drinking juice is fine uh, but i do test still retain some of that ipa characteristic uh, to the beer as well um, this beer in particular is one of uh our biggest sellers not necessarily at the farm specifically i mean it is very popular but like i said shindig was kind of our number one seller at the farm um but Hazy Days is, um, from a retail perspective, our top performer in our portfolio. So Absent Landlord used to be our number one selling beer. And then once we launched Hazy and we sort of got out of that like first three months or four months or so of sales, it eclipsed Absent Landlord and it hasn't really looked back. I mean, they teeter a little bit here and there, but for the most part, um, Hazy Days is our, is our number one in our portfolio. Um, just again, what, what the customer set really wants out there right now. Um, and it's both at retail and it's on premise. We find that uh, draft drinkers love this beer. And I was, I was talking to the group today at the farm and we were kind of thinking about, you know, what sort of brings about this uh, hazy trend. And I think what it did was it got a lot of people that wouldn't have otherwise tried IPAs into that grouping. Because I found that IPAs were very polarizing and, and probably still are if you're talking about an American IPA. Uh, some people don't like that bitterness in their beer. And when you get to a hazy IPA, you kind of get that nice little softening of the hops, if you will, and it makes it something that's much more palatable. And then you see it on a glass too, on a patio, and that cloudy, hazy appearance is very attractive. Sun's shining through it. Um, it makes it really, really gorgeous and attractive. And I think as wheat beers have started to sort of fade out of the limelight, now we're seeing hazies creep up and they, they also have that similar appearance to them too, which is, which is kind of neat. So yeah, that's, um, that's just a little bit of my take on, on hazy IPAs and, and ours in particular. Um, we also put this one in a, a 12 by 355 mil pack at the beer store, uh, just like Shindig. 
and landlord just to, to give it a chance in a new market and see how it does. And it's been received really well, which is cool. Um, but otherwise, yeah, we sell it on draft and in the 473 mil uh, cans, excuse me, um, at LCBO and, uh, and grocery. Excellent summer beer, but like you said, dangerous because you can drink too much without realizing what you've done. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a, it's a silent, silent killer for sure, but a, a delicious one. Katie was curious, how come there are so many hazy IPAs out there? Yeah, it's just, it's really because they're, they're trending. Um, it's people listening to what the market wants. They see uh, that hazy IPAs are, are dominating the top of that category. Um, I mean, you still have some other brands out there that are, that are doing very well by not being hazy in the IPA category, but hazies are, are flying up the charts really quickly and, uh, and continue to be. So as soon as somebody hits the mark on a brand, on a beer, you'll see everybody else start to follow suit and, uh, and make their own too. I'm gonna backtrack a little bit because you said like one of the things that you did was like put your, your earbuds in and listen to music. What's on your playlist right now? Mm. Um, yeah, I like to listen to, uh, to a whole bunch of different stuff. Uh, I got in trouble for this one last time, Bill. So you're leading me into a trap because I said, I like pretty much everything but country. <laughs> Not a trap. And, and, and that, <laughs> that caused some consternation. Um, so uh, I, I, I won't get too specific, but I, I do like to listen to a lot of jam band uh, stuff. I find that is very... Uh, pacifying for me when I'm getting out for a stroll and just need to clear my head for a little bit because I like getting lost not so much in lyrical music I like it when it's more musical and they go on longer jams really drawn out um, solos and and sort of riffs and modulations and that kind of stuff um, kind of peaks my brain in a different way than I'm usually stimulated in a day. So then I think that's also helping for that, that relaxation. Uh, so that's generally what I like to, to put on nice long songs. Cam's curious if Nickelback's considered country. <laughs> Nickelback is not considered country in my view and uh, also not really a Nickelback fan. Yeah. <laughs> is it considered music? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, they did well though. I'll tell you, they, uh, they made a lot of money. There's a lot of people out there listening to them. So you can't fault them for that. That's absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. So could I, I'll ask another personal question. Sure. I've ne never, never, ever checked with you if you're a reader, but what would I find on your nightstand in the form of a book right now? Yeah, uh, good question. I, I wish I was more of a reader than I am. Um, besides reading some news articles and, and that um, keeping up, I, I don't make time for myself uh, to sit down and dive into a book. And it's mostly because uh, I don't make time for it. And I do enjoy it. And uh, I will read fiction or nonfiction. I'm really not discriminate that way. Uh, but the predominant of my reading is either digital media uh, or I'm reading to my kids. <laughs> so, um, I mean, with a nine-year-old and a five-year-old though, you do get a nice little uh, difference there. So five-year-old, obviously a little more simple books, but uh, I'm reading some fun stuff uh, to my nine-year-old every night. And, uh, and that's been awesome because it's really brought back the joy of reading because you see how engaged little minds are into books. And, you know, especially with the prevalence of how much media we get today and how much screens they can soak themselves into to see still seeing them excited about a book and the story's development and the long play of a plot being drawn out as opposed to you know everything's happening instantaneously is really it's it's brought a lot of uh joy to me again to see that so i just got to find some time i need to take some vacation and uh post up with a book and and then you know that'll help with the lowering the blood pressure too right <laughs> I don't know. I think it's fantastic reading to kids because I, I, I get to occasionally babysit my grandchildren and that's just a, such a joy. I bet. You know, to be able to just read and, you know, watch how they've changed and grown over the, the last couple of years. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a, a real, yeah. real joy. Now, we've, uh, we've touched a little bit on what's, what's been happening and coming next for Cowbell. Mm-hmm. Are you willing to share with us what's next for Zach? 
Yeah, um, I mean, um, I'm I'm excited for uh, for what's to come. Uh, like we're just getting as we're getting out of the pandemic, you know, we're kind of getting our sea legs back in all of our our different areas, and I'm I'm excited about how the growth and the changes that are going to happen at the brewery, and and hopefully that means uh, growth and change for myself too. I've been a uh, territory manager with these guys for five years, and I absolutely love it. And my region's ebbed and flowed. Um, but you know, now that we're in a, we're in a better position than ever, I think to really continue to grow and with more growth comes more opportunities. And, uh, I would love to keep exploring those opportunities within Cowbell because, uh, I think it's a phenomenal outfit and, uh, we, we're surrounded by a lot of great people and, uh, I'm hoping that there's going to be some, some bigger opportunities available, um, as, as time presses on. Jen's curious what the dream job would be at Cowbell. What the dream job would be at Calva? I don't know. Probably the you know the resident beer taster. <laughs> that would be a pretty great job, right? Food taster and beer taster um, <laughs> might be a little detrimental to your overall health, but uh, it would be be pretty great. So that that could be a dream job, sure. But uh, no, I, I don't. I'm not one to uh, to aspire necessarily to be, you know, the the president of the company or anything like that. That's not necessarily where my where my aspirations lie. I'm not always a go right to the top kind of guy, but I would like to see um, some more growth in the sales region. I'm really excited for how Calbell can grow uh, in Ontario still because we got a ton of room to grow there. But as we maybe look towards to get into provincially or nationally or look at exports down into the States, I would find that as a really neat challenge and, uh, and growth learning opportunity for myself to start to uh, look at how we could burgeon out into new regions and, and manage that and, uh, and keep, keep this whole thing going. There are definitely challenges, more so interprovincially, I think, than going across the border to the U.S. It really can be. Yeah, it depends on where you're going. I mean, like Quebec's kind of a no-go zone. It's very difficult to get into there. Uh, I think New Brunswick uh, and Nova Scotia are a little bit easier, but they have some pretty high taxes. So your beer yeah. becomes quite expensive, which can be a little bit of a challenge. But I know some companies have had some success getting their beer out into B.C., um, don't know about the prairie so much but yeah i think on balance you're you're right bill there there's a lot of we don't have sort of a one-size system fits all right across the nation and that makes it a bit challenging um but uh you know challenge is uh, is good for the brain too right <laughs> it certainly is that'll be interesting yeah. um i i know just from past history of cowbell that um the organization has a, a pretty solid plan, you know, and well thought out. So that they do. Yeah. Right from inception, we sort of had this like two, five, 10 year plan on the books, which is great when you first start out because you have to have some kind of roadmap forward, but you also have to be, well, uh, cognizant that there's going to be change that happens to that two, five and 10 year plan. Uh, things like a pandemic weren't planned in no. our five year plan. And here we are five years later on uh pandemic under our belts which changed the trajectory of everything a little bit and um you know also people come and go to in the organization that have a, a profound effect on it um so yeah you know we've gone we've gone through quite a lot of um of leadership and structural changes over the last little while that uh i think have have changed the landscape of what uh cowbell is looking at now in the immediate future and and that will then change those more forward-looking plans too so it's definitely going to be very exciting and um they're they're definitely well thought out they're definitely not a quick knee-jerk reaction oh we got to do this let's do this now it's if we're going to do this why are we doing this and what's the benefit going to be is uh is sort of the thought process um as opposed to just quickly react and then you know either it yields success for you or you're you're paying for it afterwards let's try the next beer yeah absolutely uh so this one here uh for sour fans out there which again i appreciate sour can be a polarizing style um but this is the one that we currently have out there on market which is the passion fruit punch so this guy is awesome. Uh, it's a 4.8%, uh, we say American sour ale, it's a fruited sour. 
uh, we, we call the passion fruit punch uh, for a little bit of fun with the name, but it does have guava in there as well. So the predominant fruit uh, profile is passion fruit and guava. We tested a whole bunch of different stuff. We were trying to figure out, you know, what is the, what's the thing that we want to do this year for our summer sour. Uh, we had just come off the sea salt grapefruit sour for those of you that may, excuse me, may have had it, um, which was a fun one to do and uh, was very mild in its flavor set, uh, mild on the grapefruit, a little bit of sodium there to kind of balance it out. And, and that was fun and refreshing for the spring. Um, but we wanted to go a little bit more tropical for the summer months to sort of give a nod to, to the summer. Uh, so this one has that um, tropical aroma to it. You're going to get um, that passion fruit, guava, mango, if you will, on the nose. Um, you can smell that mild tartness going on as well on the beer. Um, it pours with a beautiful head and nice retention on it, which is great to see because sometimes you get sours that uh, they're, because they're quite acidic, the, the head retention doesn't stay very long. It shrinks away very fast. Um, so you get sort of a golden yellow, almost of a slight haze with this beer. Um, you get the tropical fruits on the nose. Uh, I always often found like a little bit of that like Sour Patch Candy kind of aroma going on. Like it's like when you just cracked one of those little bags of Sour Patch Candy and the kids get a Halloween. Um, flavor. You get a very mild tropical fruit punch, bit of that passion fruit, bit of guava, mild sour finish. Like it's not, it's not designed as um, a full bodied fruited sour where you're going to get like, oh my God, that's passion fruit, you know, coming at you. It doesn't scream it. It's there, but it's so balanced with the tartness that it makes it highly quaffable, very easy to drink, which is what I, I like about it. I mean, if I could have my pick personally, I would have more fruit in a beer like this uh, only because that's personally what I like. But when you look at when you're building a beer and selling it to millions of people, well, you got to have something that's going to hit the mark for everybody too. Um, it's fun. We do things out of our Renegade series that are a little bit more pointed towards certain things and, and we do those. Um, but when we're putting out a beer that's got to have some consideration for a larger market, you have to take in some considerations for how it's going to best hit in the overall marketplace. Um, so yeah, uh, this is a fun one. Uh, I, it took me a little while to get into sours. I, I wasn't something that I gravitated to from the outset of my beer drinking. And then now it's definitely part of the lineup. I really enjoy them on a hot summer day. They're super quenching. Um, and, uh, and they're fun to pair even with food too. Uh, you can get away with putting them up against some spicy dishes if you want. That tartness can cut through. Uh, I love it with like a fresh summer salad. Um, you know, even with berries in there or something like that. If you had like a strawberry salad um, or blueberries or something like that in there, it can really pair nicely on that front. Um, but yeah, this guy we launched at the beginning of May and it is currently the third best selling sour at the LCBO uh, in the province, which is awesome. It's got some great distribution um, and some really great legs behind it. A um, couple of other guys that we've been chasing in the overall rankings. Um, but yeah, this is a, it's a great one to have. We'll run this through probably till about the end of the summer, maybe bleed into a little bit of September. And then we'll be looking to put out uh, a fall, uh, more fall seasonal sour uh, in place of it. So I'm curious. Mm -hmm. You're going to stay sort of along the personal line. Um, if you could spend a day talking about beer or brewing a beer with somebody, who would it be? Hmm. That is a good question. Um, you know, I, at first thought I was like, oh, who, what, what brewer would I want to kind of gravitate to? Um, you know, one of my favorites is, uh, is my, my near and dear good friend, Stephen Rich, who was once our brewmaster at Cowbell uh, and, and a great friend of mine. We've known each other since high school. And I think the majority of our conversations when we get together dive into beer because his wealth of knowledge on beer is exceptional. 
so I can run anything by him about beer. Um, so he's probably one of my favorite people to, uh, to have a beer and discuss a beer and discuss beers and all things beer with. Um, but then I also thought when you asked the question, you know, there's, there's lots of other people like, you know, whether it was a celebrity or an athlete or something like that, that would be really cool to sit down and have a beer with and talk about beer because it's not necessarily their wheelhouse, but they would have a different comment set than somebody in the industry might about beer and how it's perceived. And, and that's really interesting too. Uh, who that would be though, I, I don't know. I can't, uh, I can't pinpoint one specific person, but it gets the wheels turning a little bit about who you might want to sit down and have a beer with. I don't know if you guys remember a little while ago, um, Barack Obama and Justin Trudeau were were caught at, I think it was Big Rig Brewery in Ottawa. I don't know if someone can correct me on that if it wasn't there. Uh, but they went up and it was just sort of the like meeting of a couple of minds and they were sharing a beer. And I thought, you know, that would have been pretty cool to be able to sit in on that conversation and just hear them talk about big picture items, but probably some pretty like, just down to earth, regular conversations. Cause at the end of the day, they're just two human beings too, uh, that have obviously held some pretty uh, high official power, but to have them sort of comment on beer and have their take on it could be, could be pretty interesting as well. It was big rig. Thank you, Troy. That's awesome. Yeah. Derek's curious where Steven's gone to. Yeah. Um, so Steven is in London and uh, um, he is, currently doing some contract work for oh my goodness what's the brewery in kellogg's our house powerhouse thank oh, you Derek. Yeah, yes. Station, powerhouse, yeah. Uh, powerhouse yeah yeah he's doing some contract work for them right now uh cool. and helping out with their uh their general operations so uh he's a happy guy he just had a, a baby not too long ago and busy busy father and uh and doing still keeping his hand in the brewing industry and uh and working on some other stuff as well too so yeah it's the best advice you've ever been given uh you know i think it's sort of that idea of uh think before you act you know take everything just with a bit of a pause before you you do the knee-jerk reaction that saved me in a lot of ways um you know, I've been quick to temper before and it doesn't really yield you with a great result. So, you know, just slowing things down a little bit, take a little bit more of a well-rounded thought on it before you, before you action. Um, and one of, that's sort of a, you know, holistic idea, but one of the more pointed things that I got from a previous sales manager when I was at another company was when you're when you're upset and inflamed about something he said write the email that you want to write and don't send it so you have that opportunity to get it up off your chest <laughs> but don't send it because it's not going to do you any good uh, so i thought that was that was actually uh, some pretty great advice in my early days because you know you dealt with some people sometimes where you're just like ah oh, well that was pretty rude and you know you kind of felt like you wanted to take a jab back but in better judgment you realize that it's it's actually uh not helpful so yeah. that was that was some very sound advice it certainly is i'm just going to point out to katie you never put the person's address in the email until after you've written it for that very reason oh yeah that <laughs> that's that, that's yeah. very true yeah whoops my yeah. finger slipped i can see that yeah that would be uh then you've undone everything you were trying to do <laughs> Uh, maybe off the record or bars or even breweries thinking a bit differently about kegs going back to patios and door dining or people expecting a surge in keg sales or a more slow incline. Great question. Um, yeah, people were thinking a little bit differently about buying kegs. Um, they, they were cautious and, and rightfully so as they, as things started to open up because everybody has, we've been in the stage, we had what, this was our third opening, right? So we had an opening and then it got taken away from us. And then we had an opening and then it got taken away from us. And so they didn't want to get stuck because it's pretty tough. Like once you tap that keg, most breweries will say, you know, it's kind of tough to, to credit that liquid afterwards. You can get a bit creative with how you can help them out, but it's, it's difficult. So they were, they were buying, they, they wanted small kegs and they wanted like one of them as opposed to two of them, because if they ran out, it wasn't the end of the world. They would 
then purchase again just in case the rug got pulled out from underneath them all of a sudden and they had to shut her down. So this this was a bit of the tentativeness that we saw uh, at the early stage. But now I would say that's changing. And I would say, if anything, this, this most recent week has been um, great for people purchasing more kegs because they realize that stage three is coming. They know that that's happening. They know indoor dining is coming. Uh, so they know that their capacity is going to swell. And um, they want to make sure that they have the volume there on hand. I will say, though, that, that bars have been a little bit more okay with running out of product on balance because the customer is less picky at the moment. The customer is generally just happy to be out on the patio. So if you go in and say, hey, I'd like a pint of Hazy Days. It's on the menu. Well, I'm sorry, we're out of Hazy Days. You're not going to blow a gasket and say, I want to talk to the manager. You know, <laughs> Not that you would anyways, but um, they're sort of more adaptable to it and it's sort of taken away the like the customer is always right it's like the customer is a little bit more understanding now um and i'm sure there's people in f and b that might argue otherwise because they'd say there's still some unruly customers out there but uh i think on balance that's kind of where things have headed so people have been a little bit more tentative about ordering when ordering less they might have run out not the end of the world customer understands everybody kind of goes forward in that in that move um so a surge in keg sales coming up. I don't know if there is a surge. I mean, it, it looks like a surge when you go from zero to whatever volume any brewery is doing right now, because <laughs> it feels like a surge that way. Um, but if you look at sort of baseline for where we were pre-pandemic to now, we're, we're on a good trajectory. If anything, you're still trying to get some customers back online because they're still only keeping 50% of their taps online or 30% of their taps online. Uh, they're not going whole hog yet because they're still just being cautious and seeing what brands are working well um, for the, the customer set that's coming through. As we close out, what's the one thing you want everyone to take away tonight? Uh, keep enjoying great beer out there um, and uh, keep trying new beer out there. There's so many wicked flavors and new players in the game. And I would say uh, that's what keeps this industry humming is, uh, is trying new stuff, giving feedback on it and trying to figure out, you know, what the next thing is that's going to be, that's uh, going to be the, the big trendy beer. So that's what I would say. Zach, thank you for being on Beers with Bill tonight. We appreciate you giving us the gift of your time and your thoughts. Uh, my pleasure. Great to be with you guys as always. Yep. Mind everybody next week, uh, Graham Spence's uh, from Block 3 is back on. And um, Derek, if you didn't see the pictures, Derek actually had an opportunity to help Eric and I brew with Marvin Dick at Wellington the other day. The release for that will be on the 11th of August and we will if everything holds to the opening actually be doing it live on the patio at Wellington Tenth, Brewery. 10th of August. 10th sorry thank you whatever day it is the, 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 the second Tuesday of August. I called Bill's bluff it worked got me in the door. I had to be nice to you once just don't let it go to your head. <laughs>